Now I'd like to introduce you to our two featured speakers, Anne Cronrod, uh, Assistant Professor of Marketing, University of Massachusetts Lowell, and Ivan Gordely, postdoctoral researcher at Ecole Normale Superior in Paris. First, uh, let me give you a bio for Anne. Um, it, she combines her deep knowledge of linguistics and marketing to research the language used in marketing situations and the outcomes of this usage. She has extensive experience in experimental design in consumer and word of mouth research. And most recently, she's been collaborating with data scientists and computational linguistics researchers to investigate her theories and make profound conclusions using large data sets of text type data. Ivan Gordely is a postdoctoral researcher and one of the directions of his research is in the field of natural language processing. In particular, he is focusing on computational approaches to investigate the usage of deception in written content. So with that, I'll turn it over to our speakers. Anne, would you uh, take over, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, hoping everybody hears me. Thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm excited to be here and to be able to share with you some uh, recent findings in uh, an emerging field of research that touches the lives of all of us in sincerity in on online user-generated content. This particular work focuses on product reviews, but as we will see in the end, our findings can be applied to other contexts as well. Uh, I would like to present the third author in, uh, in this work, Jeff Lee. He's an expert on social networks, and uh, it's the middle of the night for him, so uh, we hope that he sees us in his dreams and sends us uh, some good vibes. So there are good reasons to study the question of uh, whether, to what extent, and how do we find out if online product reviews are sincere. First, today, if I want to learn about the product in order to make a decision whether to buy it or not, I would click the review section for the product or even directly type in the search engine box uh, uh, words like uh, product XYZ reviews. People rely on product reviews sometimes even more than on professional content about those products. Second, when we read a product review, we tend to believe that it is an authentic review. Otherwise, we wouldn't be reading it, right? Third, even if we were of the suspicious kind and were expecting some of the stuff we find online to be fictitious or fraudulent, research shows that people are actually not so good at distinguishing between truth and lie just by reading or listening to it. Finally, while we rely on product reviews and tend to be both naive about them and technically unequipped to detect a lie, there are lots of reasons for marketers and consumers to post fraudulent information online. Therefore, this behavior is actually more common than we might think. Taken together, this situation calls for research that may help marketers enhance consumer online experience by identifying possible chance for fraud in online content. There are several attempts, existing attempts, to verify online content or to detect fraud through analysis of user-generated content online. For example, Yelp established customer alerts to detect fraudulent behavior and used an algorithm to classify reviews as potentially non-helpful based on aspects like length. So for example, reviews that are too short, like no good or bad service, like this is the, the whole review. Reviews like that would be classified as uh, non-helpful or potentially fraud. Uh, other websites like uh, Fake Spot, uh, and you can see other links to other places um, that suggest various ways to help consumers decide if a review can be trusted. And academic literature also involved in this activity and provides aspects such as the number of reviews written by the same reviewer or du duplicate content, etc. All of those suggest that a review may not be genuine. Among those works, there is a body of literature that specifically focuses on the language of the review as evidence of the reviewer's potential to be lying. For example, some works find that fictitious reviews tend to avoid the use of first-person pronouns like I or we and tend to be more worthy overall. 
But then along with those works, other works find that if someone wants to disguise their fraud, they would actually use more first-person pronouns and overall be less worthy in their reviews. This is a problem because it seems that with all this research and clever attempts to discover fictitious intensity reviews, the authors of these reviews are actually able to go around the system and write up reviews that will not be detected as fictitious. Therefore, in this particular project, in our project, we decided to go with an approach that starts from linguistic theory. And this helps us propose aspects of a fictitious review that are not so evident and easy to fake because they reside deeper in our cognition. We begin with a simple question. How, if at all, will the language of a person's tale be different if the author has not actually been through the event he or she is telling about? I mean, take three seconds and think, what would you tell me if I asked you to describe your recent flight to the moon? People who I asked this question told me about the view from the window, the weird looking food in space, about the feeling of no gravity, the temperature. In short, they were relying on semantic memory. Semantic memory is our lexicon, the stack of words and expressions that are associated with a certain topic in our memory. Well, within the topic of a flight to the moon, we have many words stored that relate to travel, what we know about space, and what we heard about other similar trips. If we asked Mr. Armstrong to describe his flight to the moon, he would be using actually a different kind of memory. He would be using episodic memory, the memory of episodes in one's life, which includes emotions, thoughts, visions, and sensations particular to the event we experienced. Starting off from this distinction between semantic and episodic memory and relying on the well-researched links between our thoughts and the language that we use, we're suggesting that the language that authors of fictitious reviews would be using may be characterized by at least three aspects. First, we suggest that uh, authors of fictitious reviews would be using less past tense, using less past tense because there is no memory of events or, or actions that happen one after the other so there is no real tale to convey. We would also be expecting fraudulent authors to use lower, unique, lower, lower use of unique words, to use less unique words. Here I mean words that no one else or only a few other people used to describe this event. Again, this is because you are describing something that happened only to you. Finally, we would expect people who uh, write fraudulent reviews to use more abstract or less concrete language. Here I mean using words and specifically nouns that are more generally describing the event. For example, the hotel was clean versus there wasn't a flake of dust on the floor. So to some, we predict to see less past tense, less unique words, and less concrete language in fictitious reviews. We ran two studies. The first study includes several steps and is mainly used to support our three predictions. We also use this study to see whether writers of fictitious reviews can use our theory to improve their fraudulent reviews. The second study is used to test the ability of human subjects to use our theory in order to improve their detection of fictitious reviews. So first thing first, we wanted to create a database of authentic and fictitious reviews so we can analyze their text and either support or refute our predictions. To do this, we asked participants who were recruited from an online jobs platform by Amazon Mechanical Turk called MTurk to write a review for a hotel in which they stayed, that would be the authentic reviews condition, or for a hotel in which they did not stay, which would be the fictitious reviews condition. So far, these are two conditions, authentic and fictitious reviews. But we also added a few conditions. We actually created four more conditions. 
We collected fictitious reviews from these conditions too, but participants in these conditions received one clue that could help the participants write a review that would look more authentic. We gave participants clues about the three linguistic aspects that we propose, but also about first-person pronoun, because we wanted to see if our linguistic aspects are indeed so special and, uh, and they behave in a different way or in a similar way to uh, previously found aspects. You can see an example of the wording of a clue for the unique words uh, below. So just general statistics. All in all, we had, we had about 1,200 reviews, which is about 200 reviews per condition. In this summary statistics, you can see the number of words in each condition and the maximum and minimum number of words, just uh, to uh, kind of a ballpark of uh, what we had. And I'm happy to send all the results to anyone who's interested. So what did we have for past tense? We developed text analysis tools and wrote a code in Python to discover the various aspects of our text. For the past tense specifically, we, we simply identified all the verbs in the text by tense and singled out the past tense, the past simple tense verbs. We then used the proportion of past simple verbs out of all the verbs as an indicator of using past tense. We found that writers of fictitious reviews indeed use less past tense than authentic review writers, but not significantly. So we cannot say we supported our prediction. Interestingly, when we gave people a clue about using less, less past tense in fictitious reviews, they used even less past tense. This result suggests that the extent of using past tense may not be a very reliable indicator of sincerity in product reviews. Next, we turn to unique words. We define unique words as words that repeat in the whole database less than the number of words in the whole database divided by the number of word forms. Word forms, when I say word forms, I mean that dog and dogs are different word forms. For this database, this calculation yielded the number 27. So any word that repeated less than 27 times in our database in the whole database, was considered a unique word. We then looked up the occurrences of these unique words in the different conditions. As we predicted, we found that compared with fictitious and clue conditions, these are the circles and the triangles here, Within the authentic condition, the plus signs, there were overall more words that repeated once, twice, three times, everything that is on the left. You can see that the plus signs are kind of on the upper side of the uh, figure, and the triangles and circles are uh, relatively low on the left side of the uh, figure. But then as, as you go to the right, you will see that it, the, the picture kind of changes. I will show uh, another figure. I think it's uh, more uh, clear. We could see that there were more unique words in the authentic condition. This is the solid line at the top. Then in the fictitious or the clue conditions, these are the dotted and dashed lines. And we also saw that giving people a clue did not really help them to improve their lives by using more unique words. You can see that the number of words, unique words that are used is kind of similar in the dashed and the dotted lines. Here's another representation. Okay, I think. Yeah. All right. Okay, I'm sorry, I think I had a glitch in the in the presentation. Uh, another representation of uh, ANOVA-based calculation 
The lack of difference between the fictitious and the clue condition makes sense because these reviewers did not actually have a unique experience in order to use unique words because they used their general knowledge to describe the hotel stay, like semantic memory. Next, we defined and analyzed the level of concreteness of our reviews. To obtain a measure of text concreteness, we first define concreteness as the level of depth in a hierarchy of components. You can see a quick example of this hotel ontology in red. Under rooms, there are types of rooms, and under facilities, there are types of facilities and their components. That's what I mean by hierarchy. We use a ready ontology of all words created by Princeton University researchers called WordNet. Luckily for us, the ontology of all the nouns in WordNet is organized so that there is one single word, the word entity, which is the highest order noun, the super hypername. Under entity, you will see one step lower or deeper words like physical entity or abstraction or thing. Then one step deeper, you will see nouns like physic, uh, I'm sorry, nouns like objects or substance. Then deeper, you will meet building, then hotel. And under a hotel, as shown on the slide, you will see the structure of deeper and deeper steps down the ontology. So overall, it looks like this. Sort of, right? It's, it's an ontology where every word has several words under it. We next calculated a concreteness score for each review based on the location of its nouns within this ontology. Specifically, we first defined the concreteness of each noun as the number of the steps deeper from the word entity into the ontology for each noun. Knowing the depth of each noun in a review, we then define the concreteness of a review through the following mathematical expression. In this expression, capital D is the depth or the concreteness of a review. The lowercase d represents the number of steps of a particular noun deeper from the word entity. And the letter F is term frequency or how many times the noun recurs in a review. The number of factors is equal to the number of nouns in a review. We then calculated the differences between the conditions. And similarly to the findings for unique words, we found that authentic reviews were more concrete or significantly more concrete than fictitious reviews. But those who received a clue about concreteness were not able to improve their reviews and make them more concrete. Here, too, this makes sense, simply because people had no concrete memories to share and could, not, could only use general descriptions. Very briefly, just to comment on the use of first-person pronouns, People were actually pretty good at faking it, and a clue was even more helpful in that sense. So this sort of indicates that our participants were uh, normal and that the conditions of the experiment could replicate previous literature. One last but really important thing we did uh, to validate our results, we ran the same calculations and analysis on a database of real and fake reviews that were collected by Autumn colleagues for different projects in 2011. The database was made available uh, for researchers. It includes 800 authentic and 800 fictitious reviews. Contrary to our reviews that were all written for the purpose of our project, meaning they were all invited reviews, Autumn colleagues' authentic reviews were scraped from online review sites like TripAdvisor. The fictitious reviews in their database were the only ones written similar to our reviews by mTurkers. Autumn and his colleagues did not have clues, of course. They had a different project and a different purpose. But they did have authentic and fictitious reviews, 
And that's what we needed. So all in all, Autumn Colleagues database was roughly four times larger than ours. We had about 200 reviews for each sort. And we found in our analysis that our predictions are even stronger in OTS database, which is, of course, very good news. So just to summarize, we find that fictitious reviews are less likely to use unique words and would be phrased using more abstract language compared with authentic reviews. But knowing about these two aspects does not help write better fake reviews. We do not find the same results for past tense. It looks like past tense may not be a very good indicator to detect fake reviews. I would like to turn now to a brief description of another study that we ran. This time, we asked participants to detect whether a review is authentic or fictitious. Participants read a random subset of 60 reviews, half authentic and half fictitious, from our database, and for each review, clicked a choice button, just for real or fake. They just had to decide if it's real or fake. Here again, we had five conditions. One where participants did not receive any clues and just did their job. And another four conditions in which participants received a clue about one of our predicted three linguistic features or about first-person pronouns. Counting the number of correctly identified authentic reviews and correctly identified fictitious reviews, we found that overall participants were more often identifying reviews as authentic than as fictitious, no matter what they actually were. This is a result similar to previous findings. We tend to think most of what we read online as authentic. Giving a clue, by the way, and no matter what clue, didn't help at all. Overall, the success rates for identifying reviews were around 50% success, which is very close to guessing. This is exactly what previous literature found. Funny enough, when we gave people the clues, they were overall, they detected overall more reviews as fictitious, but not the right ones. In other words, people became more suspicious following the clues, but the information did not help them become better detectors. So what do we learn from these results? First, starting from the very last point, it seems that even if we told people about our findings, it wouldn't really be helpful for consumers to read online reviews better. In fact, this might be even harmful because people become more suspicious in general but feel helpless about improving their own detection of fraud. Importantly, we found that at least two of the factors, unique words and concreteness, are pretty reliable in identification of potential insincerity. Since these factors are theory-driven, they can serve as a good tool for marketers who want to indicate to their consumers these non-obvious attempts and possibly improve their experience online. In other words, we see this works major relevance to practical marketing solutions in that it finds spots where humans are weak and lie, uh, at, are weak at lying, and it provides a technically feasible way to go around human weakness in detecting lies, which is implemented if implemented, can improve consumer online experience and trust. This work opens the door for additional research that can rely on the same theory and yield additional textual differences that indicate insincerity. And future work that uses machine learning techniques can actually develop an algorithm that would be used as a detector that relies on all verified linguistic features suggested here and in future works. The linguistic aspects of a lie suggested in this work can be applied to any text about previous events, like witness evidence, police reports, or news articles. In a world where people mostly rely on online text, such detection methods are crucial to keep our online environment safe. Thank you for your time, and I hope our results inspire people to invest efforts in improving consumer experience online. And I'm done with the presentation part. 
Thank you very much, Anne. Um, <clears throat> as a reminder uh, to those in the audience, if you do have questions, please uh, send them through uh, the chat with presenter function. And uh, we have a few that have come in. One of them is, was there a control in the analysis for the difference between positive and negative product reviews? Was that taken into account in some way? Okay. Uh, so uh, one, uh, just a small deviation before I answer directly. Uh, yep. Actually, Autumn Colleagues database, the one that I uh, described, uh, that's what they did. So they had uh, concrete um, instructions for their writers to write positive or negative reviews. And um, uh, in the reviews that they scraped, they scraped directly one-star or five-star reviews. So kind of extremely positive or extremely negative ones. And, uh, but in, in our reviews, we did not do that. We asked people to write a review of a hotel, and we did not ask them to, uh, to write a positive or a negative one. We ran a, um, a control later um, where uh, after they wrote the review, we asked them to give the number of stars. And in our database, at least, all, the reviews were all positive or the, the vast majority. So there was, we couldn't even compare the um, positive and negative reviews because there weren't enough negative. There were like uh, uh, a few, like a handful of negative reviews in the whole database. So uh, given the way you approached it, you're saying that uh, there just wasn't much data on the negative side. Do you, do you think that you know, some more uh, re additional research questions ought to focus on this difference, either the, you know, the, both the positives and the negatives and the differences or, um, or, or say more on the negatives since that's not something that uh, this study was able to get at? Is that something you think is important going forward? Uh, actually, yes. We, we've been thinking about uh, how to continue from here um, since a lot is uh, is depending on whether a review is generally positive or negative. Um, we would, in, in future research, I wouldn't ignore this question at all. I would actually incorporate it in any sort of analysis or experimental plan. Yep. May I add something? Sure, go ahead. Uh, this is Ivan here. Uh, so uh, we actually did the, the analysis for the OTS database, which is perfectly balanced for positive and negative reviews. And uh, there are significant differences between positive and negative reviews, but right. they, they usually are consistent with the, uh, so if you look at the difference between fake and real reviews, uh, the differences are consistent in both positive and negative uh, condition. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, it, it, it is actually quite important when you, when you take a particular, uh, when, you, when you are dealing with a particular situation, for instance, you consider hotel reviews uh, on uh, some website. It, you never know how balanced they are. So it could be mostly, so the fake reviews could be mostly negative or mostly positive. It depends on the particular situation. So. Uh, this, uh, the, the way the uh, reviews are, if they are mostly positive or negative, may affect some of the, some of the ling conclusions uh, based on linguistic features. So it is important. Yep. So a question came up, uh, is this study uh, running only in English? And I think the importance of that question is to what extent from this study, whether it's in English or other languages, you, you think there are important differences between language. Well, I'm not saying you necessarily have data on it now, but is that an issue that you think is important? So as far as there are linguistic differences between languages, yes, obviously we will um, have to kind of uh, to conclude that our conclusions cannot be universal. For particularly for unique words and concreteness, I would argue that this is a universal finding. Of course, I need to test it before actually arguing, but uh, I would expect it to be universal. For the use of past tense, there are differences between languages in the way past tense is constructed at all. 
and how past tense so, so for example in some languages there's just one past one form of past tense uh, and, and it would be used both for stories and for other descriptions that are not chronological and in that sense well we didn't find it to be a, a reliable detector anyway but if it was I would say okay but we need to see if in different languages it would be um, as reliable for example or non-reliable right another question lots of fake reviews are potentially generated by machine rather than by humans so can the patterns that are identified here be applied to detect machine-generated reviews as opposed to human-generated? Um, so, depends what machine, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but uh, I want to uh, add to this question, actually, another question that I heard uh, um, before about um, you know uh, poets or writers who can actually do much better at anything that has to do with writing um, just because they are good at it. So um, I think all these uh, attempts need to be tested. I can't just tell you now, well, a machine can't have specific memories. Um, a machine can... Um, Although it doesn't have uh, like uh, you know a brain of its own or memories of its own, um, it can definitely make up and um, and look alike uh, as a, look like uh, someone. So and the, and then this brings me back just to the question: <laughs> which machine? Okay. But uh, but uh, if, I... if we continue, if if all of this continues and there's a uh, uh, actually, a development of uh, of this initial research and, uh, and other researchers in this field into a nice automated machine learning based uh, way to detect fictitious reviews, then there will be probably also a machine that can write one. Yeah. Um, another, Ivan, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Uh, no. Yes. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, this particular study is uh, uh, the, th the theoretical uh, background is based on humans. So we are looking at how humans uh, write when they don't have a particular experience. So, of course, it doesn't. It wouldn't apply to to, mach to a machine. Uh, however, if uh, uh, as far as I know, the the way machines write fake reviews right now is quite basic. It's not very elaborate. So at this point in time, it, if, you, if you try to detect a fake review written by machine, I think it shouldn't be that hard to do. But uh, you would use a completely different uh, ways to do it. So yeah, it sounds like an issue that's going to uh, evolve over time and uh, research will no doubt play a role uh, in, in detecting other ways to detect uh, fake reviews, and then, like you said, the uh, the actual algorithms will probably get better too in writing them. Um, yes. Do you have an estimate of what fraction of the reviews are fraudulent in the world today? For example, in forums like Amazon, you presented uh, an interesting chart. So there's a high degree of belief in reviews. <laughs> it would be interesting to compare that to. Uh, what you believe is the actual number or percentage of, of fraudulent reviews out there? Um, yeah, the, well, the, there is uh, there are a few estimates, but and they are uh, I want to warn you they are very different. One is about five percent. I heard about fourteen percent, and it's kind of it really depends how you test it and how do you know and uh, how would you, so it's all estimates. I would be kind of careful about that. I'm not sure. So again, another area for uh, more investigation. Mm -hmm. Can you so, analyze, uh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Ivan. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is actually very dependent on the platform. So uh, there, are, uh, there is a research which estimates the number of fake reviews on different platforms, and it is very different. 
in particular because uh, each platform, Amazon, Kickstarter, they all use their own filtering already. So they are filtering some number of fake reviews uh, by their own algorithms. Uh, so uh, you, you have to look at the specific platform to, uh, to see what, what is the fraction of fake reviews. Yeah. yeah. Another question is, can you analyze the authentic reviews to determine the features of an experience, for example, a hotel stay, that made the greatest impression? Uh, could this provide more insight than just the overall ratings of predetermined items? Made the greatest impression. Yeah, and the idea is to to basically identify the features of the, the component features of the experience maybe that, that were driving that. Is that something that, that you could look at uh, possibly with this kind of data? May I uh, try to answer? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah, go so, ahead. Um, uh, it, it is a rather standard problem in machine learning, so you, you could uh, set uh, this problem to yourself and uh, try to answer it, but you, you need a much bigger database than we have, uh, which, which could, shouldn't be necessarily a problem. You can collect many more reviews if you wanted to, and uh, you could do some clustering and uh, see what, uh, what will be the important features in these reviews. Well, sort of to build on that, have you considered uh, other environmental characteristics impact, such as characteristics of the reviewer or a product, uh, and you mentioned platform, that was part of this other question, that that could all have a difference. So the question is, that are you looking at a wider set of factors in the environment that could impact the reviews? So, so something this that is, is a uh, very good okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, Anne. Uh, th this is a very good question, and uh, we are not looking at this. We are dealing purely with linguistic features of a text. Uh, however, other people did look at it, and in particular, I remember a study of uh, Kickstarter projects, and they looked at both uh, content-based and uh, um, text features, uh, b both at the linguistic features and at the features like how many reviews did this person post, uh, 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 how many projects did this person post on the, on the platform, uh, what, uh, what is their age, and, and so on, uh, many other parameters. What they found is that uh, in their case, in that particular platform, uh, linguistic features alone gave uh, better predictions, uh, better accuracy uh, when they actually built an algorithm which was uh, trying to uh, predict if uh, a project was fake or not. And uh, they found that uh, linguistic features alone gave better results than incorporating uh, the, this other information and better results than using just that information. It, it doesn't mean that in, in case of hotel reviews it will be this, the same, but uh, it, it, uh, it shows that uh, linguistic analysis alone is uh, quite meaningful. You know, another question that sort of uh, builds a little bit on one of your, your points there about building an algorithm to detect the fake review, uh, do you visualize that ultimately Machines will be better than humans to, under, to uncover authentic versus fake reviews. Is this, do you now turn it, you know, instead of researchers, you turn it to algorithms, will they, will they have a higher, uh, higher success rate with uncovering? Yes, yes. Uh, so machines are already better. As uh, uh, Anne has presented, uh, humans have uh, very bad uh, capability to determine if reviews are fake or real, it's, it's almost uh, uh, it's similar to just chance, just guessing. And uh, the, uh, many people did algorithms uh, for different platforms and different uh, contexts, and they usually work uh, relatively well. I, I was actually quite surprised how well they work. Sometimes uh, they have uh, up to 90% predictability. 
uh, accuracy and higher. Uh, it, um, the, the, the way people usually approach this problem is they, they have many, many, many features, 10,000s of features, uh, and uh, uh, the way they select the features is, is, is not smart. They just take uh, uh, 10,000 of various features without uh, trying to guess which ones will be the important, the important ones, and then they build a machine learning algorithm. Uh, and uh, with good predictability. The, um, uh, the problem is that these algorithms, they usually work well for a particular situation. So for instance, if you want to uh, evaluate pro hotel reviews, uh, and then you want to evaluate reviews of uh, cars, you would, uh, you would have to build a, a different algorithm. So, uh, our, we approach this problem from a different side. We want to see which linguistic features will be relevant in any case when, yep. when hu humans have this. Yeah. 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 I wanted to add to the previous question about uh, other aspects, aspects that are other than linguistics. So um, people were asking about us about ex previous experience. So think about it. I'm, all I'm asking you to write is a review of a hotel in which you haven't stayed, but you did stay in another hotel, and you can just re replace the experience and, and describe a pretty authentic experience with a different hotel name. That's it. So the fact that we managed to find differences, even though people did have previous experience and we have in the data, we ask people if they have stayed in hotels before and how many hotels they have stayed, so people did have previous experience, um, which they could use as their unique experience for this. Even despite this fact, we found differences. We see this as a sort of a, like a conservative test of, of the theory. Um, but, but in other theories, it might not be very uh, helpful to, to, to detect uh, if people have experience or not. So yes, there are lots of factors that we can take into account. Well, and uh, yeah, that's uh, I think we've covered a lot of interesting questions here about that. Just you know, identifying different factors that that you did already take into account, and others that uh, potentially could be. Let me uh, shift. There's a, some questions sort of on the practical side of this, and people would like to know. Uh, you know, what are the practices in companies to, you know, use it? What are they doing right now to detect fake reviews? Is that something that you were able to look into, or do you, you have any background on that? I know your research is, is with uh, users and consumers, but do you have a sense of industry practices now? Yeah. Um you know, how are they, if you know, what, what are companies doing to detect the fake reviews is really the, the first practical issue that I see that's come up here. From my experience talking with companies, they are, well, I don't want to generalize, uh, and I'm sure I, I wouldn't be very correct uh, because I don't know all the companies, but those that I talked to, um, they were kind of, well, uh, this uh, feeling of we, we need to but we can't uh, was sort of the, the feeling that, um, that was present in my conversations with those companies. These were just conversations. Nobody, you know, I, I, I wasn't hired in any of those and didn't actually do any work. Uh, there so are some you, attempts, and yeah. So when you say they can't, you're, are, are you saying that uh, they would like to know, but they they don't have they haven't put the effort into it, or they? Or are you saying there's some some absolute barrier they literally cannot approach that problem? I, maybe for some other reason. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm saying very generally speaking that it's very complicated actually. Yeah. Uh, what Ivan was saying about the. 90% success. This is uh, indeed a very particular and very specifically structured kind of experiment where, or a data analysis that, that you run. And to reach this 
uh, way, uh, the, the specific data analysis. It really depends on what's your text and how they are built and how they are collected. Uh, so it's kind of a, it's, tech, it's both technical complexity and and I would say also kind of a, um, on the theoretical level sort of complexity that I just don't know if um, if companies are um, at this point if they want to invest the effort in this sort of uh, uh, of detection partially because the managers of the companies are also just like us, they are naive. They are not sure how many really reviews are um, are uh, are deceitful. We just don't know. Right. So th there's the unanswered questions, which they would like to know, and just how much uh, untruth is out there, how many fake reviews or percentage or whatever. Um, you also raised some questions, I think, in your last uh, slide about sort of the uh, the role of fake reviews in the future, um, maybe even, if I remember correctly, the uh, the context or the ethics of doing this. Do you have any more thoughts on that, or any more to elaborate on? Like, will this research, how will this research be used? I guess uh, both by by the companies and by the individuals and perhaps other authorities. I just think there's some interesting issues that are are. Uh, they're not explicitly the ones you research, but they're uh, sort of lying beneath the surface here about how this kind of research will be thought of and will be used going forward. So uh, someone mentioned here a machine learning uh, uh, algorithm that is uh, that would be superior and like uh, uh, makes me want to to you know to make a movie about this. Um, but I think I would ultimately want to take the results that we have so far, kind of like as they are, take one step back, go back to the theory. That's what I do best. Go back to the theory, take a look, and, and see what other aspects would be yielded by the same theory. And then the next step would be to try and build up a machine learning algorithm that would do the work Kind of in an orderly manner, and this can be actually used as a tool, so like a like a feature uh, that ultimately consumers can um, read reviews and they will see either a flag or some sort of indicator in uh, I don't know the percentage uh, of the chance that this review might uh, not be authentic. So it, it gets back to your point about improving customer online experience and trust. And yes. if, if there was more science, uh, more understanding of how these things work and, and what, what's true and what's not true, that would continue in that direction of uh, improving the online experience and trust. That's kind of the, the framing of it that you have at this point. Yes. Yes, our, uh, our initial point or, or the, like the, um, the motivation for this research was the um, interest in ways to improve consumer trust online, specifically because we are online all the time and we don't always know where the information is coming from. Yep. That's very helpful. Uh, just checking here to see if there are any other questions there was a question here by uh, someone asked about uh, the way we define um, uh, unique words. Yeah, go so ahead. So I don't know if uh, technical questions are uh, at this point. Oh, go or, ahead. If you, uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to use this uh, uh, this question in order to um, – to maybe clarify something, if, if, if it wasn't clear when, when I expre ex explained, it's not like that we defined a particular set of words that is by, by their topic or something uh, in, in a database. We just do pretty blunt counting, uh, right? We, we count all the words and we take out of the words, we take how many word forms, different word forms, like the dog and the dog different word forms that are in the database. 
and then we run just a very easy kind of simple frequency analysis, frequency of occurrence of all the words, each of the word forms, how many times it occurs, just a frequency analysis. Um, and then we just calculate uh, what would be considered a unique word in this particular database. It depends mainly on the size of the database and on the number of unique, uh, I'm sorry, on the number of word forms. So you could have a huge database of, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of words, but all of them are the same words. I don't know, I, 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 you know, like that. So for example, and then you would, uh, your calculation of what is a unique word would be dependent on that. Uh, so it's not like a particular set of words that we need to define and in that particular question it was uh, about how can a brand identify this unique word set. So it's not that you need to do that. And it's kind of that the beauty, the beauty in it is that you don't need to do that. You just run a frequency analysis. Right. I hope uh, I'm answering it uh, to the satisfaction of uh, the question. Yeah, and if, if people have more uh, specific questions about that, they, they can contact you. Uh, we're getting toward the end of our, our time. One other uh, method question was raised. What did you pay the uh, respondents in the study? Uh, because others have experienced varying results depending on how much you pay the respondents. Do you think, well, first of all, what did you pay them and do you think that has much of an impact? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yes, so we paid them, uh, as far as I remember, it was a dollar for their work. It was about 10 minutes of everything together. Um, this was a couple of years ago, though, so it might change today. Um, from what I know from other works that uh, specifically try to see the impact of reward on lying, um, actually, when you are rewarded more, you would be lying less. So kind of uh, sometimes people lie more when they are not rewarded. Um, and this speaks to the internal and external motivations of people to post fraudulent online reviews. Okay. Um, one other question related to that or same individual is, did you use machine learning? You mentioned machine learning in part of your presentation. I'm just trying to paraphrase mm -hmm. this question. Did you use that uh, to find differences? Mm -hmm. You mentioned that for okay, one yeah. of the other studies. Yeah, I'm sorry if it wasn't clear. Uh, we did not uh, use machine learning techniques uh, yet. We, uh, it's, it's sort of for, for us, this is a, um, a kind of a, a beginning of a path that we are going to take. And uh, in future, yes, we are discussing uh, how we can use machine learning to, uh, to train a machine to detect uh, fictitious uh, events or fictitious uh, tales, um, not necessarily uh, reviews, by using these uh, aspects that we are discussing right now. Right now, we just use ex experimental and uh, right. text analysis techniques. So uh, I, I would like to add on this. Uh, so the, the way I understood the question, uh, the, uh, Joseph was suggesting that we use machine learning to actually identify the important features. So um, it could be done. So y usually what uh, you get out of it is rather complex features which could, can be very difficult to understand from a theoretical point of view. And uh, our goal is the opposite. Our goal is to identify features which ca we can predict theoretically from uh, from using psycholinguistic approach, and uh, in this way we can probably apply uh, th th use those features in a machine learning algorithm to predict fake uh, or authentic reviews uh, with uh, in a, in a more general uh, setup. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one other question I see here is, did you remove some verbs for passive tense when you did the uh, 
classification of the, the language, or did you keep them in? Uh, wait, I'm thinking. What did we do with the passive tense? You're right about this question. Yeah. Okay. We did, I th okay, I think we did not use past tense because uh, we, t we, tried to, we tried to incorporate it and then we saw that um, the, <laughs> the work that it would take, so we saw a few instances and there were not enough for us to incorporate them and to try to analyze them as separate or as influencing the result in any way. Yeah. Ivan, do you remember something else? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I actually did. Uh, we did both. We did uh, all the past tense verbs together, and uh, uh, so in, including yeah. or, and excluding. Uh, I think this you the, what you presented today was excluding the passive. Passive yeah. tense was excluded. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for those clarifications, and thank you all for the questions. And of course. Uh, <clears throat> Thanks to our uh, presenters, Anne and, Ev and Ivan, for a great presentation, stimulated a lot of questions across a, a very wide range of, of issues. If you do have more questions, uh, feel free to communicate with our presenters today. You have Anne's uh, email address up there on the screen. And uh, again, thanks very much for giving the presentation. I'll just note that our next webinar uh, will be on creating signature stories with David Ocker on February 27th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Many thanks to the members of the MSI audience for participating today in our member-to-member -member webinar series.